The annals of fighting game history are filled with legendary games, awe-inspiring moves, and iconic characters that made button bashers beloved the world over. I could spend hours examining any one of these games that made up the very bedrock of the fighting genre, but instead, I'm just going to blab about Toshin then. Arena Toshinden was marketed as a big PlayStation exclusive as Sony needed a hot new fighter to usher in their first console, and to that effect, even co-published it in the West, while Takara held it down in Japan. Now yes, Tekken was obviously there as well, but that was wholly owned by Namco. Sony positioned Toshinden as a virtual fighter killer, which is a tactic we all know works out really well. It did so by touting itself as the first true 3D fighting game, which was about as legit a claim as Blast Processing was, and something we'll get into a bit later on. It was developed by Tamsoft, a company, if you are a fan of the greatest combination of objects, swords, and titties, you should recognize. With Toshinden as a base for three-dimensional fighting, they would then go on to make 1,456 games in the Simple 2000 series, including One Chambara. After that, they would give Iki Tausen a go, and then most famously of all, the Senran Kagura series. If you look carefully, well actually you don't even really need to look carefully, you can definitely see some parallels between all four. Now, marketing jargon aside, Toshin Den was indeed the first 3D weapons-based fighter ever, beating out Soul Edge to the punch, or, or blade, by a few months to a year. It told a simple story about eight warriors drawn into an underground fighting tournament, each with their own goals and motivations. These included Eiji Shinjo, Kayan Amoa, Sophia, Rungo Iron, Mondo, Fo Fi, Ellis, and finally, Duke B. Rambert. Ah, such a great porn name there. Since this was a 90s fighting game though, there were of course two unlockable bosses, Gaia and Sho Shinjo, Eiji's edgy brother. While other 3D fighters offered dozens or even hundreds of moves and techniques, Toshinden basically just replicated the 2D games of the day when it came to complexity. You had basic punches and kicks, massive moon jumps, and a few flashy special moves, all of which stuck closely to Street Fighter's established repertoire. One thing that slightly set it apart from its contemporaries was in its supers. If your life was low, you could perform a powerful maneuver that could win you the match, called a desperation. But each fighter was also equipped with a secret super that, while you didn't need to be low on health to perform, was usually an insane command to pull off in the heat of battle. Like really bro? Now, as to how Sony and Takara got away with calling it the first true 3D fighting game was with its dodge mechanic. This would just cause you to leap in a circular path around your opponent, beating Midway's War Gods and its iconic 3D button by a good few years. In terms of getting the game out there, Sony's famous marketing mascot Polygon Man heavily promoted it in magazines and comics, as well as the whip-toting blonde bombshell Sophia, who was always front and center in any campaign, I can't imagine why. Toshin Den's flashy graphics and weapons helped it stand out, even if everything it was doing was neither new or very deep at all. Where it did excel was with its cast of colorful characters, buoyed by some fun voice acting Got it. Got it. Got it. Oh, oh. and an amazing OST, chock full of some bombastic and catchy tunes. I distinctly remember using a cassette player to record the game's music off my TV. It wasn't the best, most high quality recording, but then again, technology has always limited me. Toshin Den also managed to garner a good number of positive reviews, especially from EGM, who label it their fighting game of the year in 1995 only for them to then label it as one of the most overrated games of all time about 10 years later. So, coupled with those strong reviews and even stronger marketing, resulted in Toshin Den becoming a pretty big hit for all involved, easily selling over a million copies worldwide and leading to a direct sequel. However, 
this is where the history of Toshin Den gets needlessly complicated. We're going to be entering a world filled with random ports, enhancements, confusing releases, one-offs, spin-offs, and rotating publishers. Fortunately, the series would only get better from here quality-wise before it gets slightly worse. In a stark contrast to Sony's claims of it being a PlayStation exclusive and that it would kill the Sega Saturn, the next year Toshinden arrived on the Sega Saturn in Japan in the guise of Toshinden S, I assume for special, and Toshinden Remix for North America, and it was even published by Sega themselves. It's a remix via some brand new additions. There's a fresh, more elaborate intro. Cupido joins the roster as the game's true final boss, but who cares about that? They added a bollock story mode that fleshes out the character backstories. Now, as to why fleshes out is in quotes, well... Look at this youngster! I know you, Fofi. Magician! Killer. Finally, we have the Game Boy version, which is one of those rare Game Boy versions that very much recognizes the limits of being the Game Boy version. Fortunately, what that means is that they scaled it down appropriately, as the fighters are all super deformed, but still brimming with charm. To this day, it remains very playable and also looks quite good when played via the Super Game Boy. It also has its own exclusive character, Uranus. I mean, Uranus. No, Uranus! Yeah, the, uh, there, that's the one. Oh wait, I forgot, there's still yet another version. Despite Sony's flex about PS1 exclusivity, as we can see, it was anything but pretty much the RE4 of its day. This leads us to the Windows 95 port, which is just so, so weird. A PC port of a 3D Japanese fighting game in the 90s? The only other game I could think of that did that was, oh yeah, right. Now, this version was largely the same as the PlayStation original. Um, it swapped out the music and voiceovers for the Japanese version one, uh, runs at a higher frame rate, but because it was published by Playmates Interactive, Earthworm, fucking Jim, is playable in Japanese fighting game. Wow, just anyway, that concludes Toshin Ten One. Things start to make even less sense from here. For whatever reason, Sony dropped Toshin Den cold turkey, but who should step in but Capcom themselves? They distributed the arcade version, yes, the arcade version of Toshin Den 2 worldwide, and that just blows my mind for a litany of reasons. One, Capcom, and two, this Toshin Den was an arcade game first. How often does that happen, that a series which was exclusive to consoles then gets a sequel in the arcades? Well, that's just what happened here. What's even weirder is that Capcom didn't publish the home ports, as that would fall again to Playmates, but no Earthworm Jim this time. Even stranger than that, Playmates didn't publish the PC version anymore for North America, because that would default to THQ. Well, what's going on? Anyway, Toshin Den 2 was an improved sequel in every way. The problem was that it wasn't a much more improved sequel. It had slightly better graphics, was faster overall, and an overdrive meter now powered multiple supers. Three new characters also joined the fray, and thankfully, they're all pretty dope. Tracy was a 90s as hell cop caricature, armed with tonfas, whereas Chaos was a crazy scythe wielding madman, and both were great additions to the lineup. Gaia was also now a selectable regular fighter, and got some new samurai-esque threads. Secret characters were still very much a thing, as Uranus and Sho both returned, but Cupido was MIA. The two new big bads were Master, the head of the evil generic as hell syndicate that runs the tournament, and then we have Vermilion. Verm was, and still is, a cool as hell character, but he was always incredibly unbalanced. Also, it bears mentioning that Toshiden 2 has one of the greatest intros of all time. It 
If you want to see more, then check out the inaugural episode of Fighting Game Theater. Also, and get used to this, a Greatest Hits version of the PlayStation Edition was released and saw a significant amount of improvements to the graphics, controls, AI, and a fighter-wide rebalancing. Unfortunately, this release, which was under the best line, and officially titled Toshinden 2 Plus, never made its way outside of Japan. That is the part you're going to need to get used to. So while it's a better game than one, it unfortunately lacked the hype and backing by Sony, and critically, it was received slightly worse. This is because both Tekken 2 and VF2 saw massive improvements and were released around the same time, so Toshinden 2 was often unfavorably compared to them. It also sold worse than the original, but that still amounted to a half million copies sold worldwide, and thus Tamsoft just kept churning out more. That's the thing about Toshinden, though. During the course of just one short console generation, there were five distinct entries, which, when you aren't an especially deep or groundbreaking game, that type of release schedule can result in burnout and apathy. This was then exemplified by the fact that Tamsoft didn't directly follow up on 3, at least not right away. Unlike the Saturn's Toshinden Remix, they went in a different direction this time and instead made Battle Arena Toshinden URA, which awesomely stood for Ultimate Revenge Attack, and wasn't a port of 2, but rather an all-new game. It was a Saturn exclusive that not only had new story, moves, characters, and gameplay tweaks, but a fairly different art style and graphical fidelity. It's not bad per se, just eh, different, I guess. It's choppier with an altered color palette that's just a little less visually appealing. Timeline-wise, it fancies itself as an alternate sequel or side story from what was established in Toshinden Remix. It's focused around Replicant, a robotic version of Sho Shinjo, who has gone rogue, killing off various fighters. Now, Replicant's creator, the scientist uh, Ron Ron, gets mixed up in all this mess, so both of them were added to the roster. That's not all, though, as a dude by the name of Ripper also shows up from out of nowhere and is kind of the new protag, I think? Finally, there's Wolf, the new Antag, who is the one who had captured Replicant as part of his plot to do something. These four new fighters replaced characters from the PlayStation version of 2, so if you're a fan of Master, Show, Uranus, and Chaos, well, <laughs> find a new main, I guess. Ura feels noticeably different than Toshinden 2. Definitely a bit slower, maybe? I personally think it's a neat version with some cool new characters, but it was absolutely savaged in reviews, with many magazines citing it as a low point for the series. Because of this and the Saturn's general unpopularity, it only sold an estimated 13,000 copies in Japan, which, considering that the PlayStation version sold hundreds of thousands of copies, Ura was kind of a tiny, massive failure. It's then no surprise that this was the last Toshinden game released on Sega hardware. Now, the next game we're going to touch upon in the franchise is the one that I've played not a lot ever at all. Toshinden Nito Shinden, roughly translated to a benevolent true story, is much like the Game Boy version that we talked about earlier. More accurately, just it, it's just a lot like Virtua Fighter Kids. Nito Shinden trades in the serious martial arts death tournament for a more light-hearted school-based affair. The gameplay is also simplified, and considering we're talking about fucking Toshinden here, that's not exactly a good thing. You now have four normal attacks, only one special attack, and one desperation. That's it. Combined with the odd low-to-the-floor camera angle and its already stripped-down mechanics, it's barely worth tracking down unless you're a completionist. The roster in general is very gutted, taking out any character that doesn't quite fit what they were going for, so no Fofi, Gaia, Rungo, or etc. At some point, the game was being considered for an international release, but was cancelled for reasons unknown. 
Since it was clear that Takara and Tamsoft were closely monitoring whatever Virtua Fighter was doing, that the low sales of VF Kids probably contributed to the lack of a Western release. So let's just move on. 1997's Battle Arena Toshin Den 3 was Tamsoft really trying to shake the franchise up, and they certainly succeeded. The big change here was twofold, a massive increase in characters and placing said characters in caged arenas, eschewing the ring outs of the previous games. It wasn't just for show though, fighters would bounce off the walls or even the roof, leading to more combo opportunities. It, in fact, the game was more focused on speed and combos than ever, leading to a very rushed down style of gameplay. More supers were thrown in, specifically soul bombs, which were a kind of AoE explosion that you had a limited stock of. Toshinden 2's modest roster of 15 fighters more than doubled here to 32, which was probably the biggest scene in a 3D game at the time that, oh wait, no, actually Mega Mix beat it. This huge increase was achieved rather sneakily by Tamsoft, I might add, as all the extra fighters were built off the main cast, featuring reskinned weapons, some animations, and special moves. Now, they all had their own distinct costumes, names, and some supers, but there's a whole lot of recycling going on here. Think Smash's Echo Fighters. The entire new cast included David, Judgment, Ten Count, Leon, Zola, Kulin, Tujin, Balga, Atuhua, Adam, Tao, Rachel, Schultz, Miss Till, Abel, Vale, Behu, Shizuka, Nagisa, and finally, Naru. Reviews for Toshin Den 3 were generally stronger overall, citing how the game was a much bigger jump over its predecessor, although the increased speed to the gameplay caused the graphics to take a noticeable hit, to keep things fluid. Even with these changes though, outlets were still critical about the lack of depth, and once again compared it to the competitors we've mentioned so many times already. It always seemed that despite a strong start, Toshinden was always living in Tekken and VF's shadow, and that shadow would only get bigger from here on out. 1999's Toshinden 4, no battle arena this time, was released only in Europe and Japan, where it was simply called Toshinden Subaru. Why did Playmates not publish this time? Well, that's due to them being really busy going out of business, which happened in 1998. I guess with them out of the picture, there were no other US publishers willing to give the series another chance, especially since each entry was giving diminishing returns. Taking place 10 years after Toshinden 3, it places this in the new generation template of character rosters, which means, with history as our guide, that the game will either be super awesome or just kind of awkward. Toshinden 4 lands squarely in the latter. Everyone is kind of loosely grouped together in teams for some reason, so Team 1, Subaru Shinjo, Naru Amoa, Rook Castle. Team 2, Puella Marionetta, Lancelot Lake Knight, and Fan Barefoot. Team 3, Genma Miyabi and... <laughs> Bang Boo. Then we have the unlockable boss characters, E.G. Shinjo and Eos. But then there's also Team 5 all by himself, the mighty Vermilion. So that's exactly two original characters from the previous game surrounded by a bunch of babies. Toshinden 4 is different, but not like Toshinden 3 good different, the bad kind of different. It goes back to the much slower gameplay of the first two games and gets rid of the caged arenas. I don't know why. The art style has also changed, and in my opinion, for the worst. It's adopted a much younger, almost SD look, looking a lot like the shonen animes which were all the rage at the time. This looks really odd when applied to EG or Vermilion, and honestly, it's not too far away from how Nito Shinden looked. Aside from that, I don't really have much to say about Toshinden 4. There's more anime-esque story sequences for the main mode, supers are more cinematic, but there's really nothing much here improved over Toshinden 3. In fact, it's regressed in a lot of key ways. 
There's little to zero information on how it performed sales-wise, but I can't imagine it did very well, as Takara didn't pursue any more sequels afterwards, especially after they merged with Tommy Toys in 2005. I suppose it bears mentioning, but there's technically, very technically, one more Toshinden. 2009's Wii exclusive, Toshinden! That's just what it was called. Published by Takara Tommy, it's a completely different game with zero connections to the previous titles, outside of the generic main hero having the last name of Shinjo. If I hadn't included it in this video though, I'm sure some of you would have let me know about it. At its core, it's an arena-based fighter where you have free movement and features a brand new cast of fighters, playing a lot like uh, Castlevania Judgment if you wanted a parallel. It was developed by Dream Factory, the makers of... Which it shares some similarities with. It features a mix of projectile-based, weapon-based, and melee fighters, but none of them particularly stand out. I would have personally appreciated a boss or unlockable character from the old games because uh, what was even the point of this? Calling it Toshinden, but having nothing to do with Toshinden. I mean, I suppose Tamsoft were busy in the Onichambara mines at the time, and maybe they would have done that, but... Well, I digress. While certainly not a bad game, it just fails to make much of an impression, and gameplay-wise, it doesn't do anything all that interesting. It's functional, and that's the best thing I can say about it. And with that, we conclude on the mainline fighting games of the venerated Toshinden franchise. There were, of course, other bits and bobs. There was a Toshinden puzzle game, if you can believe it. Well, I mean, Street Fighter had a puzzle game, so yeah, why not? It was another PlayStation and Japanese exclusive though, so let me know in the comments if you've played it. I have not. You could also do much of the same if you were one of the few that has played Toshinden Card Quest, an even more obscure uh, b board card game. What is this? Moving right along, EG also appeared as an unlockable character in... Uh, D absurd Die, die, Exar D third. I, I just yeah. It's a Saturn exclusive fighter that, say it with me, was never released outside of Japan. Honestly, though, it doesn't look too bad. I do wish this had come over. And finally, there was Masami Obari's legendary anime adaptation, which we'll talk about in a future episode of the Fighting Game Theater, I think. Oh yes, we will indeed talk about it. I wonder what's going to appear next. Hmm? Battle Arena Toshinden is by no means a legendary series, but, but it certainly had its place for a few years in the greater fighting game ecosystem. It has some great characters, simple pick-up-and-play mechanics, and a memorable soundtrack. If I was to suggest a particular one, I think Toshinden 3 is the most playable, still pretty fun to this day, and has the most characters to chew through. Lots of fun memories playing it against friends on a lazy summer weekend. Will the franchise ever return? Well, the last official release the series ever got was being included on the PlayStation Classic. Probably not the best form to showcase it, but hey, it was there. At the very least, Sony still remembers the game, and Takara Tommy and Tamsoft are all still in business, so there's always the chance we might enter the battle arena one more time. If you enjoyed this retrospective, let me know if there's a franchise you'd like to see get the same treatment, I already did Bloody Roar, or hit up the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big boss to officially nominate the one you want to see next. Thanks for watching, Warriors, and I'll see you next time.